Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from the creativepen.com and today I'm here with Liliana Hart. Hi Liliana. Hello, how are you? Oh, I'm good. It's so good to have you on the show. But just a little introduction for anyone who doesn't know you. Liliana is a New York Times, USA Today and Publishers Weekly best-selling romantic suspense and mystery author of over 40 books. She's also an entrepreneur running the Silver Heart Author Resources site with her husband, Chief of Police Scott Silveri, which is just brilliant. And um, so Liliana, look, you know, you're a mega star indie. You've sold over three million books you've made all these bestseller lists and you're incredibly successful but it wasn't always this way was it so no (laughs) maybe you could just take us a step back tell us how you got Uh into writing self-publishing um you know so back where a lot of people listening are today yeah a lot of I, I hear that a lot like um like overnight success and and I'm like, well, you know, I've been writing for 17 years and only the last four of them <laughs> have been <laughs> successful. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I just, my history, um, you know, I started started writing. I actually completed uh, several novels. Um, you know, I landed an agent. Actually, after my first novel, I landed my first agent. Mm. And um, I have the, um, well, I'm knock on wood, but I have the, you know, don't have all the best agent luck. Um so my first agent, you know, um, books went out on submission, um, and then almost immediately pulled because she had to um, close her, her agency because her husband got sick with cancer. So, um, you know, those books came back in, and, and then second agent, I had written another book, sorry, my eyes water, and I don't know why. Um, and then she got pregnant, went on maternity leave, <laughs> <laughs> and she decided not to come back. And then my third agent, you know, and I had more books by that time, and actually it was my third agent, um, uh, we had that was right at 2010, and you know, in 2010, um, uh, you know, just publishing was just in the toilet. Nobody was buying anything. There was a, um, there was really a, a freeze on on everything. Um, and she was she was really the one that mentioned to me, you know, why don't you self publish? Mm. And um, you know, she was a good agent. She had a lot of huge authors, and so I started. Um, I started self-publishing, you know, during her time and actually, um, uh, ended up, you know, parting ways on good terms, but, um, it was just, um, I, I kept saying something big is about to happen. I can feel it. You know, it's, you know, things are about to happen. And so I left and actually it was a week later that I hit the New York times list for the first time. And, um, and then, you know, I'm still with my current agent. I've been with him a couple of years, but you know, it has not been a, um, you know, just overnight, Overnight <laughs> success. success. You know, it's been a lot of hard work and a lot of hours and a lot of books written, a lot of words on the page and mm. um a lot of wanting to quit but not quitting, you know. Yeah. Um so I mean the, the first, you know, like I said, you know, 17 years that's a long time and and the first 13 of of those were rejection after I mean hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rejection. I actually had four books, four different books. Um Addison Holmes was one of them, JJ Graves was one of those first books. And um, they were actually acquired by editors from different houses. Mm. And, um, you know, we want to buy this book. And then when it got to marketing, marketing said, we can't shelve this anywhere. Mm. We can't shelve it in mystery. We can't shelve it in romance. It's too much of both, you know. Um, And so, you know, that happened four times to me. Like a book acquired that an editor loved it. And then then it got to marketing and then it, it got shot down, you know. And so I was, you know, about the fourth time that happened, I was like, I was like, okay, I can't, you know, you just get to that point where you're like, I can't take it anymore, you know, when is this going to happen? And um, it turned out that having that kind of cross-genre appeal um, mm-hmm. is really what helped with self-publishing, I think, because readers don't like to be told that, that you know, they can only have this in mystery and only this in romance, you know, they, they like the cross-genre appeal. Mm. And so are you kind of, so what do you use an agent for now? Because you self-publish all your mm-hmm. books yourself do, yes. right now. Yeah. Right now he does um, all foreign stuff for me, mm-hmm. um, just with traditional publishers. And he does, um, you know, any film, things like that. And and I do, you know, I, I do get offers from um, big houses occasionally. So, mm. um, you know, he filters all that and, and yeah. comes to me with 
whatever information he has to come with. So, so I think I think it's really important for people to know how long your your journey is, but also then it kind of everything took off for you. Um, and we're going to come back to to that in a minute. But um, you know, at Thriller Fest, uh, we met earlier this year at Thriller Fest, mm-hmm. and uh, you mentioned that you are against exclusivity. And one of the things that mm-hmm. many people are doing right now, of course, is pulling off going back to KDP Select. They, you know, taking over the world, and many people think you can only make money in KDP Select. So um, why are you, you know, why are you so into non-exclusivity? Well, I I think, first of all, because this is not a flash in the pan career. Mm. It is not, um, uh, it it is for some people, it's a hobby. And, you know, they're looking to make that quick, quick money. Um, But if anybody that's looking at this, I mean, you know, I, I spent that long going through rejection after rejection, you know, and those are the people that looking are looking for careers. And, you know, I, I'm not looking at tomorrow. I'm looking five years from now and ten years from now. And where the market's going to be, where I'm going to be, where publishing is going to be. And um, for anyone to think that ten years from now that Amazon is going to be the only game in town, I think is, I don't want to say the word foolish, but I think it is foolish. You know, I think it, from a business sense, it is. Um, it's not having a broad scope of the spectrum Um, because it is a business. I am a publisher. Um, I run a publishing house and anybody that self publishes, that's what you do. It's a business and, and people need to treat it that way. And um, you know, one of the things I kind of did for my, you know, the workshop I'm doing this weekend, you know, when I started in, you know, 2011, 2010, 2011 is really when self publishing started taking off. It was a, you know, it was still very looked down upon. It was, Mm. It was almost like this, everybody was kind of sneaking into it, you know, because nobody, nobody wanted to admit they were doing it. And then, um, um, you know, but we were seeing immediate results, you know. So, you know, it was kind of like this, is this really happening? Is this really real? And then 2012 came along and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, what's, you know, this can't last forever. And it's almost like play money, you know, mm-hmm. and you keep working and you keep doing and and it's exciting and And you put more books out because you can, you know, for somebody that didn't make money for 13 years while they were writing, and all of a sudden you're seeing all this money, the more you do, the more money you make. Mm. And then it gets to be almost like a game. It it is. It's like Monopoly money. And then, you know, 2013 hit, and, um, you know, you're like, uh, I think 2013 was like the golden year, (laughs) you know, it was, was a good year for a, you know, really everyone, I think, um, you know, uh, it was still easy to be visible. Amazon hadn't figured out how to manipulate the algorithms all together. You know, publishers couldn't, hadn't gotten enough information to, you know, kind of put dampers on everything. So there, it was like a, a free for all 2013 was, you know, um, uh, you know, we were speaking at, for the first time at, you know, big book fairs, you know, with London mm. and, and um, BEA and and Frankfurt and, um, you know, it's just, so it was really a power year, I think, Mm. because that's when, um, you know, publishers started adopting self-publishing models and using the same tools that we're using and the same pricing structure and the same sales and the same freebies and and they started adjusting with all of that and um, and really copying the self-publishing model. Actually, I've had, um, I've gotten emails from, big five publishers before asking, you know, how I did it something a certain way. And, mm. and, you know, I'm, could they you know, pay you to consult? No, <laughs> <laughs> but they don't mind sending the emails to ask. But, um, you know, so it's, um, so 2014 hit. And I think that I call 2014, like the year that like the wheat's kind of separated from the shaft, because at that point, it's a job, it's a business, the fun and games and monopoly money are over. It's who can sustain Hmm. Um, at that point, because that's when, you know, the real hurdles started happening, you know, KU rolled out in July and of 2014, um, you know, and in January, starting in January, 2014, um, publishers, you know, came out hitting hard and heavy, you know, there were a lot of blog posts from, um, you know, CEOs and, and of, of the publishing houses, you know, with all these, their stats, um, Hmm. uh, about how eBooks were in decline and there was a 35% decline in the eBook market. Which, yeah, their market is in a decline, but, um, you know, none of those stats included uh, self-publishing in books. Um, you know, so it, it was a lot of fear and scare tactics and, 
and then um, you know as as the year went on and, and then KU rolled out and, and I think that is a lot of it is you know with the exclusivity it is it is fear mm. that um, drives that because it was e- uh, to be quite honest it was easy to make money those first three years um, and you know people were qu- quitting their day jobs and they're you know they're uh, not making the wisest they're not thinking like a business you know they're not not ready to um, it was just play at that point and um, and so that's when you really see I think 2014 it roll out who's going to be able to sustain but um, I think anybody that is looking to be here in 10 and 20 years and still continue to do this is not going to to be able to to do exclusive and um, and I know that there are <laughs> you know, like, you know, Hugh is one of my dearest friends and mm. we will argue about this till the day that we die, mm. you know, <laughs> but, um, because he's all on the exclusivity train, but to him, you know, I mean, he's about to sail on, on his, on his boat. boat. Yeah. <laughs> he's about to sail on his boat, you know, it's like to him, it's not, you know, he just wants to write and it's not, he doesn't look at it the same way. I think a lot of us do is that career, mm. you know, it, it's pleasing one you know, one day at a time kind of thing instead of a, a really goal-oriented, futuristic look on um, how to sustain for the long haul. And um, I think that's really Im- important to realize is that, um, you know, I, I, think the, I think the biggest issue with KU, in my opinion, is that it's teaching readers to devalue books. Um, you know, aside from the exclusivity, um, you know, I, I was one of the authors that was offered the opportunity to be in KU uh, right when it rolled out for, and I guess for six months without having to be exclusive. Mm. And I did it. And then, um, and I actually pulled out of it early because I didn't, even with the extra all-star bonuses and stuff like that I was getting, I still was not, it, there was nothing, no way would I have made up the money that I make from other retailers. First, the first, I've never actually gotten negative emails or comments about my pricing ever. Mm. I mean, I charge, you know, up to four, you know, I charge four ninety nine, five ninety nine, and up for my books mm. and I always have. And, and I've never had complaints from readers about my pricing. And the first uh, emails that I got after I pulled out were, well, you have a new book out, but I've, I'm used to getting it for free. Yeah. And, um, you know, they're like, I'm not going to pay four ninety nine for a book. And I'm like, well, you know, <laughs> then you're not reading my books. That, so you're not going to read my books. <laughs> Um, you know, I think you're going to see similar to what happened in the music business, but, um, just from a business standpoint, when, when you're going exclusive like that, um, you know, I sell three times at iBooks what I do at Amazon Mm. and, um, iBooks is huge. They have a billion, you know, Apple has a billion devices and, um, you know, and KU has 700,000 books to be offered (laughs) in their, you know, in their program. But when you're looking at the the competition, you know, uh, as far as like the the stats of rising, like who has has come the furthest in the five years, mm. um, iBooks charts they have moved progressed much faster than any other retailer as far as um, you know what they've done in, in book sales and stuff like that. Mm. And I, I think that um, I think to put all your eggs in, in Amazon's basket is a mistake. Mm. Um, well, let's um, let's just talk a bit more about iBooks because when you said mm-hmm. that at Thriller Fest, there was like an audible gasp in the room, uh-huh. <laughs> and and people uh-huh. were like, "How can you make more money in iBooks than than Amazon?" So maybe could, could you talk about like what are some things people d- can do, or what did you do mm-hmm. to actually move the needle at iBooks, which let's face it doesn't have an algorithm in the same way that Amazon does. Oh, and and I can't explain. Um, you know. The reason that I like iBooks is because they, of all the retailers, um, all the big, you know, the five retailers, um, and I'm including like Google Play and, and you know, Kobo, Barnes & Noble, Amazon into that. Um, the reason I like iBooks is because when you go to their store, that is the truest sense of what readers want to read. Mm-hmm. Um, you're right. They don't have algorithms that y- you can't buy spots. You can't buy the number one spot in the store. Um, you can't buy paid advertising. The book that is number one in the store is number one in the store because the readers put it there. And so you can really get a sense of the true, a true top 100, a true, you know, in each category. And, um, 
you know, the readers are a little different. Um, free books work extremely well, uh, extremely well in, uh, at iBooks. And actually, they're, um, you know, the percentage of downloads of free books increased by 39% last year. And, um, you know, it's, it, and it's not free book hoarding like you see at Amazon. You know, you see them go through and then you don't see the sell-through in your next books in the series. And um, I actually had a, a book, the first book in a series of uh, J.J. Graves' Dirty Little Secrets. They, it was an editorial pick for um, Book of the Week, which means I had to make it free for the entire week. And, um, and then the editorial team would promote it through the site. Um, and that book was downloaded you know, at, at iBooks at the time, and this was a couple years ago, so mm. 60,000 downloads in a week was incredible. But within three days, I saw the rise of the next books in the series. Um, so people were reading the book immediately and then buying. All of those books are still in the top 100. Really? Wow. That one promotion. And um, the sustainability at iBooks is, um, you know, you're not going to see those crazy jumps and... Um, and uh, ranking and, um, you know, and, and, you know, ranking is, is skewed at Amazon now anyway because it's prioritized to, to KU and KDP KU. Select. Mm. And, um, you know, that's, I, I think that's hard for authors to see because, you know, I've been number five, number six in the Amazon store um, for sales and uh, I'm selling the same number of books, but my rankings are way lower, you know, and I think, mm. you know, I think it, it's, everything is, I think everything is purposely done. Amazon is a business. They're not stupid. Um, they're a corporation. They know exactly what they're doing. And uh, I love the people at Amazon. I talk to them all the time, you know, but at the same time, you know, they're running a business and I'm running a business and um, they're going to do what's best for their business. Let's face it, you know, they can, <laughs> if, if that fear is in there, that's what authors are going to be like, well, I got to make money now. I've, I've quit my job. I've done all this stuff mm -hmm. and that's going to make money now. But in 10 years from now, when you've alienated a huge percentage of your readership and um, you know that's hard to get back you mm. know yes yeah, so I guess there we've got uh, we talked there about kind of having a free first in series that is really important and mm. writing a series which I think everybody knows now but do you like do you drive traffic differently for iBooks than you do for Amazon so do you do specific Facebook ads to iBooks I do for example? yes I do I I am um, I do. I'll drive them directly to iBooks. I'll drive them directly to Amazon, and I'll run them at different times, you know, to see to do um, just test, I guess, test ads and stuff like that. But um, I'll tweet directly to um, iBooks, you know, and and they they recommend that when you um, when you promote your book, don't promote a glut of links for every store, you know, mm -hmm. divide them up, and and then they'll retweet you um, once you start doing that. But um, yeah, I found free books uh, work especially well, and also pre-orders um, mm. uh, a great way to gain a foothold at Amazon or at uh, Apple is um, is with pre-orders, and they are the only ones that will let you put in an assetless pre-order, which means you do not have to have a finished book, you do not have to have any part of the book. Yeah, it, you know, you don't have to have a cover, you don't have to have anything, and you can put it up for pre-order a year in advance. And um, that's huge um, as far as, as sales and, you know, just getting the word out and, and also drawing attention to yourself from them. Because if they see that a book is, is getting good pre-order numbers and you've got that long, they're going to do something about it. It also gives the marketing and merchandising team, um, you know, something to do about it. I actually talked to someone last week and they're like, well, I let um, iBooks know that I had a new release come out and it, and it was like two days away from the release. Well, I mean, we're in September right now, and I have a February release, and we're already talking about marketing and merchandising for my February release. Right. So you've got to have, you've got to give them plenty of time to do stuff for you. You know, you can't um, just send them an email and be like, hey, do this stuff for me. You know, yeah, I mean, it's Monday. a well-oiled machine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they really do. I mean, there's a team involved, and they, you know, they sit down and have meetings, and they talk about the books because, and and I think, you know, they're very much in the book business. You know, they're going to promote and sell books. And actually at iBooks, my, uh, my romances don't sell it at iBooks. Um, mm. I mean, they sell, but not, you know, but my mysteries are the ones that sell at iBooks. It's a different kind of reader. Um, they are, they don't mind paying a higher price. Mm. Um, you know, 
they have no no issues with um, you know free books work well, but cheap books do not work well at iBooks. Mm. Um, so price high, and um, but those um, those pre orders are amazing, and they also don't count against your rank um, mm. like at Amazon. So you can actually be on in the top one hundred as a pre order, and then when the book drops, um, you can you'll still get the rank of all the pre orders for that day. So. Um, you know, it's pre-orders help sell books a lot along with the, the freebie I'm trying to think what else I'm missing. Mm. Well, it's, again, um, I think well, from what you've said, you almost, you always have to completely change your mindset around iBooks compared to the way that people have been doing yes. things at Kindle. And like you said, you need a production schedule uh, and you need to know when the release is coming so you can actually yes. organize that. And let's face it, most indies don't do that. Yeah. It, that's I know my production thing. schedule at least a year in advance. Um, yeah. And that's a, an advanced thing, I think. But, um, yeah. you know. I mean, that's a business. Yeah, it's a business thing. Mm. You know, um, and, and I can't, you know, I can't stress that enough. You know, it's a business. It's a publishing house. What publishing house doesn't know what books they don't have that are cannot coming out a year from now, you know, or yeah. two, really two years from now. They're yeah. already, you know, they're already shelving for 2017. I have a, a schedule and a board and, you know, I'm... I'm scheduled through next December. I know exactly what's coming out, when it's coming out, and what I have to write, the amount of words I have to write, and what books, you know. Mm. And um, hope you've put some yeah. holidays in there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I am getting better at that. I am getting better. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, one other thing on iBooks is um, that they've recently changed, because obviously there's been iBooks and iTunes kind of completely separate for years. They've right. now kind of slightly more integrated it. So you could, from iBooks, you can see the audio books. Yes, um, yes. How, how are the audio book sales going on iTunes? Uh, you know, given that most people are now kind of going with ACX exclusive deals and stuff, how do you mm -hmm. feel the audio book market is shifting? And, you know, what is your advice around audio books with I, iTunes specifically? Well, I was actually just looking at the um, the audiobook. Audiobooks became, or you know, at Audible, um, it actually became a billion dollar industry last year mm -hmm. for the first time. It is a huge um, increase in a uh, percentage of, of market sales. Um, you know, just with, with audiobooks. If you're not in already audiobooks, you should be in audiobooks. But that's mm -hmm. my my caveat is with ACX. Um, I was fortunate enough to be in on that original contract mm. with, that was the, the 50 to 90% graduated royalty rate, and now it's the 40% flat. And um, when they changed that, I actually scheduled my next five or six audiobooks so I could get under that contract. I have not signed um, a new audio contract with them since the 40%, and I probably will not mm. um, at this point because... Um, you know, just doing the math, you know, I can't, I can't see the point of paying up front, you know, a couple thousand dollars for my production of my audiobook and then only retaining 40% of the, the royalties. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I've never been a fan of the 50 50 split. I don't think that that's, um, you know, just splitting your royalties with anyone is a, a bad, you know, business move. Um, cause, you know, six years from now, if you become, you know, the next, Twilight or whatever and you know I mean that it did what it took Twilight six years to, to be a hit you know it was out six years before it, you know you know stuff like that happens all the time these mm. sleeper books that that gain word of mouth and, and slow moving like that I mean what's you never, never want to be in a fix where you're you're the yeah that sleeper hit and then all of a sudden you're having to give 50 percent of your royalties away to somebody that didn't write the book I love how you think that big that that kind of big is great yeah <laughs> <laughs> but, but back on um, actually selling audiobooks, do you yeah. have any tips for kind of people to, to kind um, of market on yeah, iBooks I, specifically? On iBooks specifically, it's still a grow. It's a slower market um, for iBooks. Um, I am seeing the increase, but um, you know, I I actually have on my website an audio page, mm. and um, there's sound clouds on there of every one of my audiobooks. People can go through and listen to samples. And then they can purchase, like, the, the iBooks link is right beneath it. They can click on that and, um, you know, go directly to the, to the store to buy the, um, mm. the audio book. But um, I found that's a huge, that increased my audio sales a lot, just having that accessibility on my website and the samples right there. Um, you know, and, and I promote them just on social media. I'll be like, you know, I'll put all four covers of the audio and, 
Um, they do have give um, uh, so many giveaways that you can do for um, you know audiobooks and mm. and also for your um, oh what is it your just your regular ebooks you know download codes and and uh, stuff like that that you can do giveaways with and I always give you know I'll give away like five first copies and then. Mm. Yeah, um, we, should, we should just stress that a bit more. So iBooks have, uh, it's unlimited codes, isn't it, that you can, da- or no, is it 50? I think it might be 50. I was gonna, well, it could be 50. I was going to say, my first instinct was to say it was 250. Oh, uh, okay. Well, it's quite a lot anyway. So you can it's get quite a lot. free codes to give <laughs> uh-huh. away um, for um, iBooks. Yeah. Scott tells me it is 250. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Wow, that's loads. So you can give that many away. And h- how important do you think reviews are on iBooks? Because you kind of get the sense that Amazon now reviews count for algorithm juice. But, yeah. you know, what does it matter on iBooks? It matters um, that people, basically at iBooks, people look at the star percentage rating. Um, you, don't have to de- you don't have to leave a review to, to star it, um, which I've always thought is nice. Mm. Um, but, um, and people at iBooks review, like the readers that, you know, cause at the end of your book, that star comes up and you can, you can star it. Mm. Um, I think, I think just like anything, um, you know, if they're like, like I look, always look for four stars of that, you know, and, um, just as a reader. Mm. Um, and I, I think probably too, I think, um, and, and they have the statistics to tell you, you know, iBooks readers are, um, they are career driven people. They're, busy people they're people that read on the train on the um you know while they're traveling um while commuting you know things like that they um they want efficiency um so they're going to do things like that um you know just look at the star rating and make a quick purchase download and go Mm. um so i i think it's a different type of reader for sure and what do you think about like for example the foreign you know because most people's sales are still big in the US and UK mm-hmm. Canada but the biggest phone in China is the iPhone for example I mean what yeah. do you, what do you see as like the and of course Germany people are seeing the sales what do you see as the global expansion of digital well a, I was gonna say a year ago um and, and well 2013 that golden year when nothing there were no obstacles and then <laughs> The beginning of 2014, uh, you know, that was a big thing for all of us that had been in it a while was the global market, the global market, uh, translations, um, you know, all, all these things. And um, and then the VAT tax mm. came along. Mm. And I think that's been, uh, that's hurt authors, it's hurt readers. Um, and so I think there's been a huge slowdown in the global market. Um, you know, one of our biggest things was, you know, two years ago was, to get started on translations, um, now it's kind of a waste of money mm. right now because the um, the global market cannot sustain what you're having to spend on translations. Yeah, I agree in translation, but in English, I'm seeing sales in like yes. lots and more countries. France, um, you know, Germany is always huge for English sales, um, mm. and and I'm seeing a huge uptick of English sales in France mm. also. Um, but um, really, I'm not seeing a huge. I mean. It's it's pretty much stayed the same. I do think the VAT tax has has hurt everyone. Uh, Damn the EU. You know, <laughs> uh, I, well, you know, it's either it's either we as authors raise our prices, yeah, to equal it out, and then the the reader, you know, has to pay more, or we eat it and we're you know we lose money and to mm-hmm. keep the cost down for the reader. So it's a uh, um, you know it's mm-hmm. not a good situation for anyone. But I think it's it's for sure slowed the go- the global market. Um, Mm. So um, I think, you know, my wisest advice there, especially everybody that's um, kind of entrenched with, you know, with translations and stuff like that is to slow down. There's no, there's no hurry now, um, you know, because because there's not a market to sustain it right now. Mm. Uh, yeah, and that's agree. it's a huge expense. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. I've I've stopped doing them as well. It's just like yeah. yeah, it's just no. Even Spanish in the American market, you'd think Spanish ebooks would be selling, but Spanish has never been big. Yeah. Um, uh, and I always tell people, they're like, I'm going to get them done with Spanish. I'm like, don't do Spanish. Spanish is probably your fifth language you need to do. Mm. Uh, you know, German is, is one. And then, you know, you've got, uh, you've got French, you've got Italian, you've got Brazilian, Portuguese, and then Spanish. It's not mm. a big selling language for, uh, for books. So mm. 
the translations. Yeah. yeah. So, so then what, do you, what else do you see? Because like you said, um, people should be looking ahead, thinking of this as a longer term <laughs> career. Um, you know, what, 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 do you, what else do you think is coming? What should people be doing to kind of position well, themselves? Well, I think, um, well, you know, I think Barbara Freedy started it, you know, when she made the deal with Ingram. Um, I think you're going to start seeing a lot more indies come out in print. Um, and then the, the deal that, um, you know, create space and Jamie McGuire did with Walmart. Mm. Um, I think you're going to see a lot more of that kind of thing. And I think it's going to kind of upend things for a little bit because that's really been, um, you know, that's the argument I've been hearing from publishers for the last year or so, you know, when they'll come, um, to me with, with offers and stuff like that. It's like, you know, we are your avenue for print. And now that's no longer the case. So um, I think you're going to, you know, see a shift there and, and they're going to have to rethink things. And, and um, you know, it's going to be interesting for print because I think especially indies that are selling a lot, they're looking for print. They're looking to, to get that next corner of the market, um, a different avenue of readers. So um, I think that's, that's going to be a biggie. Um, I think audiobooks right now are probably the safest thing to do. Um, you know, I would probably sell the rights to my next – audiobooks instead of going um just to um ACX mm -hmm. yeah just because of the percentage you know that mm -hmm. I'm just not happy with the contract now um and, and that's something you know I think is really important you know with translations too I've had the biggest headache with translations and and um you know that's something that you know Bella Andre you know she's talked about several times you know she went with one company for translations it was a disaster. You know, she was out thousands and thousands of dollars. So we all got together and we're like, okay, we're going to try this company. And, um, and I guess I was the test dummy for that one because I went all in and, you know, had, um, you know, a lot of translations done. You know, total would it ended up being something, you know, I mean, it's a couple hundred thousand dollar investment mm -hmm. to, to, do, um, to do translations. And well, here I am a year later and I don't have any translations, but I'm out a hundred and something thousand dollars. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's just finding companies, you know, that are reliable and what are you going to do? I'm in the U S they're not, mm. you know, you're, you're looking at legal battles. You're looking at, you know, and, and, you know, look at your contracts. This is where, um, you know, having always having an attorney look at your contracts and stuff like that. And, and, um, is, is handy and, and not, you know, that's, that's something, you know, thinking like a business, you know, you, there are things that you're good at and things you're not going to be good at. Far, learn, learn what to farm out and what to, you know, what your expertise what you, what is. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, of course, you know, you're taking your business. I mean, you're CEO of the, uh, you know, multi-million dollar company and now you and Scott, have started Silver Heart. Yeah. So um, tell us about that and, and what, what the plan is with that. Yeah, well, we basically just started, decided that we need to, to be able to combine what we do and because um, otherwise we never see each other or get to <laughs> spend time together. But, you know, it's, um, you know, I write mystery, I write romantic suspense and, you know, he's been in law enforcement for, you know, 26 years and he actually just retired last week. Oh, uh, congratulations. <laughs> He's got like a retirement beard and everything. He's going all crazy. Um, but, uh, you know, we just combined those two things, um, self-publishing and, um, and writing and then law enforcement. And so it's a site designed um, really as a resource for writers. So, I mean, very rarely do you come across a book that doesn't have some kind of cop or firefighter or, mm -hmm. you know, some kind of public safety you know, reading these articles or, you know, I mean, just about ridiculous stuff, you know, mm. oh, that yeah. research Crazy. is like the bane of your existence. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's fun. I love mm. research, but I'll spend three days looking like at one knife or something like that. And, <laughs> and instead of writing, you know, 10,000 words or something, but, um, you know, we have all those resources on the site. So, um, you know, if you, need to talk to a Navy SEAL, if you need to talk to a cop, if you need to talk to a firefighter or, or a medical examiner or a para paramedic or, you know, if you need to talk to an inspector from London if, or mm -hmm. a, a Canadian or, you know, um, you know, we've got somebody from South Africa, you know, just different perspectives from all over the world of public safety. And if you have a question or need to know a procedure or how something works, you can go in and you can talk directly to them mm. and uh, ask the questions. Um, there's also video libraries, you know, where you can go in, you know, just from how to um, 
you know, things as basic as, as this is how you put on a uniform and this is, you know, the order, this is how it's supposed to look to like duty regs and, you know, the different weapons and, mm. and, um, you know, same thing with fire, you know, arson investigator, things like that, you know. And then on the publishing side, um, we have, um, you know, we have those, so the law enforcement and public so, uh, safety subject matter experts. And then on the publishing side, we have a whole group of New York Times bestselling authors that are um, very successful self-publishers. And, um, you know, you can go in and ask them any questions that you might have. And there's a whole list of um, frequently asked questions and, and things like that. And everybody's very accessible. So um, that was our whole goal is to just save everybody some time and have every everything in one location. So, um, so you know, just, yeah, t tell people where that location is. Oh, okay. Um, it's at silverheartwriters.com. Brilliant. And that's heart with an A, H-A-R-T. Yes, like, yes H-A-R-T, Silverheart. Yeah. Brilliant. And, and then I just wanted to ask you just one more question on the balance because, you, oh, yeah. you know, you've put on your blog uh, and it's, it's written there, you know, that you, you know, you worked very hard. You had, you know, you, you got sick last year that, you know, you, 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 this high volume production model, which has been popularized by romance writers mainly, and that many people feel has become this sort of burden. Um, does, is that the way it has to be? I mean, it seems like you've now found more of a balance and, you know, you've got married and everything. So I hope you're, you're managing your personal time you know so how, uh -huh. how can people balance that running a business and you know real life no I think I think you said the right word it should not become a burden you know something that you love to do and that you're passionate about should never become a burden and um, you know it's everybody's going to push it at different levels you're going to be able to to accomplish different things and have different goals I'm always going to push hard and push fast and mm. and because that's just the way I am I don't know how to do it any other way and um, and if I don't do it that way, then I start thinking of other things, like the ideas and businesses and things like that. And so I just add to my, my plate. But I, I think um, my biggest thing was that I never took time outside of work or writing or traveling. You know, I had, um, you know, there were a couple years in a row when I had 50 flights a year. And I was mm. speaking and I was signing and I was traveling everywhere. And I was still writing several books a year. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd have like eight or nine releases in a year and you know you you do you your body can't sustain it your mind can't sustain it um and it's just, it's not healthy but um you know that's that was I almost got sick was a good thing mm -hmm. <laughs> I should say it was not a good thing but it was a good thing because I was forced to slow down and um and heal you know but um you know just you find out very quickly that nothing has, it doesn't have to be done. You know, you, you're setting your own pace with this. Um, you know, as, as long as you are continuing to write and continuing to put out, um, you know, quality content, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, every week, every month, every three months, you know, every four months. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my goal, like my long-term goal is to be able to get down to two, two books a year. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I'm completely happy and satisfied with that and I know that I can sustain and I think that's why I pushed so hard is because I knew I had to get to a point where I could sustain and to be able to take some time off when we'll add an extra couple days to each end of a trip you know mm -hmm. that is a business trip just to um, and we might be working you know I might be writing but you know we might be sitting out by a pool or you know whatever enjoying ourselves and mm -hmm. going to dinner or shows or whatever um, you know in the meantime so it's not just all work and nothing else and, and so. we should um, we should also tell people about you know you have children too. Like so many people say, yes. oh you know you must be just you know just a woman on your own, or whatever you know. But you, oh, yeah. you've got so, kids, right? Yeah, a bunch of them. Yeah. <laughs> so people can do this yeah. with children. Oh yeah, you know I mean when I started writing, um, when I started writing seriously, I um, had a two and a three year old at home, and um, you know, and I was a, a band director. And I don't know, I don't know if you guys have band directors there, but in the state of, you know, I was from Texas and Texas, it's like being a football coach. I mean, you work in 80 hours a week. Um, so I had two small children and I was doing that and I was writing during my conference period and lunch periods and, you know, passing periods. And I was getting up at four o'clock in the morning to be at practice, you know, but I would still have my writing time and I'd write when I got home. You do things that you find the time to do it if you want to do it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and so, yeah, I mean, 
those two children somehow increased and now we have a lot more children, <laughs> but, um, you know, we have a, a lot of kids and, and they're all small. I mean, um, you know, the youngest is still six and, and they go up from there, you know, up to 23. So it's not like, um, it's not like they're not involved in things, you know, they're, they're not out of the house and, and gone. They're still, mm. you know, but you figure out how to do it. If, um, you know, you have to make family work, you have to make, the business work and the career work and you have to make your personal relationships work. So, mm. um, Brilliant. it's not, it's not easy, but you can do it. You and, know? and you, you still love it, right? This is still what you love. I do. Oh yeah. I can't imagine doing anything else. You know, mm. um, I think that's, that's why I have those five and 10 year and, you know, long term goals like that, because I have to see that, you know, that I can keep going and still, you know, sustain and, and, and things like that. And actually, like, one of the things that I've been doing a lot of research, you know, just um, statistical research for um, a lot of workshops that I do and stuff like that. And I was going back through, and I'm like, how amazing that we're in 2015, and since January of 2015, there's been an indie, uh, an indie author on the New York Times list every week but two. Wow. That's, un- you know, that's amazing. Mm. And, um, you know, we've seen the New York Times list shrink from 30 to 25 to 20, and now it's at 15. Really? To try and push it's, us all out? <laughs> yeah, you know, and um, yeah, basically, mm. you know, and so you see that and, and um, you know, and it's like all these stumbling blocks get in the way. And there's always going to be stumbling blocks. There's always going to be a KU. There's always going to be the New York Times list shrinking. There's, there's always going to be, there's always going to be a VAT tax. There's always mm. going to be a royalty change like uh, ACX there's always going to be something and it's people that are successful at what they do in this business will look at that and then figure out a way around it and they'll go they'll they'll figure out a way to where they're still making money and they still have a career and they're still producing books mm-hmm. and they're still able to, to live off what they do um they're not going to you, those are not going to be the people that you're you're hearing you know the, the sky is falling and it's all mm-hmm. over and and I've got to jump in exclusive now or I'm going to lose my whole career. Or, you, know, you will not never hear those people um, that are successful saying those things. They're going to keep their head down and they're going to, they're going to move around it. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. Brilliant. Uh, so good to talk to you. You've been so inspiring as ever. Just tell people where they can find you and your okay. books online. Uh, well, my books are everywhere at all the retailers. Uh, but uh, you can check out my website at lilianahart.com. Brilliant. Thanks so much for your time, Liliana. That was great. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.